First, we will summarize the features that distinguish flowering plants from gymnosperms. Next, we will describe the ecological and economic significance of flowering plants. We will then distinguish between monocots and eudicots, the two largest classes of flowering plants. And next, we will briefly explain the life cycle of flowering plants and describe double fertilization. Next, we will discuss some of the evolutionary adaptations of flowering plants. And then we will trace the evolution of flowering plants from gymnosperms. We, can all, we will also distinguish between basal angiosperms and core angiosperms. And lastly, we will briefly describe the distinguishing characteristics and give an example of each of the following flowering plant families. Let us now start with the discussion of flowering plants. Flowering plants, or angiosperms, are classified in the phylum Anthophyta, from the Greek word anthos, meaning flower, and phyte, which means plant. It is consisting of at least 300,000 species, and they are Earth's dominant plants. Flowering plants come in a wide variety of sizes and forms, from herbaceous violets to ivy vines, to massive eucalyptus trees. Some flowering plants, tulips and roses, for example, have large conspicuous flowers. Others, such as grasses and oaks, produce small inconspicuous flowers. So as you can tell, flowering plants produce flowers in different varieties of sizes, forms, and appearance. Angiosperms or flowering plants are vascular plants which means that they have special vascular tissue in them, namely the two types of vascular tissue, phloem and xylem, are behind the movement of water, minerals, and the products of photosynthesis. They also form flowers for sexual reproduction and produce seeds enclosed in fruits after a unique double fertilization process, which will be discussed later. In this slide, we can see the development of orange flowers to fruit. For the first picture, we have a picture of an orange flower. The orange has a scientific name of Citrus sinensis. Then B, for the second photo, we have the diagram of an orange flower. So we can see here the parts of a flower. Let us first start with a brief discussion for each of its parts. First, we have the stamen. Stamen is the pollen-producing part of a flower. It consists of the anther and the filament. Next, we have the stigma. The stigma is the part of the pistil where pollen germinates. Next, we have the style. The style is the stalk that supports the stigma and connects it to the ovary. Next, we have the ovary. The ovary is the female organ of a flower. The ovary contains ovules, which develop into seeds upon fertilization. Next, we have the nectaries. Nectaries are often found at the base of the stamens. They provide food, rewards for insects and bird pollinators. Next, we have the sepals. The sepals are modified leaves that function to protect the flower bud. They are the structure that covers or envelops it. Next, we have the ovule. The ovule is the organ that forms the seeds of flowering plants. And lastly, we have the petals. The petals are modified leaves that surround the reproductive parts of flowers. They are often brightly colored or unusually shaped to attract pollinators. For the next photo, we have the photo of developing ovaries. At this point, the petals drop or wither and the ovary starts to enlarge and ripen into what we know as fruit. And for the last photo, we have a picture of the fully developed orange fruit. Now, we will differentiate flower plants from the gymnosperms. Here is a table containing a comparison between flowering plants and gymnosperms. We will be differentiating them based on the following characteristics. The growth habit, conducting cells in xylem, reproductive structures, pollen grain transfer, fertilization, and seeds. So first, for the growth habit, 
Gymnast ferns are woody trees and shrubs, while flowering plants are woody or herbaceous. Next, for the conducting cells in xylem, gymnast ferns have shrapids, while flowering plants also have shrapids and vessel elements. Next, we have the reproductive structures. For the gymnast ferns, we have cones, and for flowering plants, we have the flowers. Next, for the pollen grain transfer, for gymnosperms, we have wind, and for the flowering plants, we have animals, wind, or water. Fertilization for gymnosperms is a unification of an egg and sperm cell, which forms into a zygote. While for flowering plants, we have two, as characterized by double fertilization. We have the egg and the sperm cell result into a zygote, and two polar nuclei and sperm cell form an endosperm. And lastly, for the seeds, for the gymnosperms, its seeds are exposed or born on scales of cones. And for flowering plants, the seeds are enclosed within a fruit. After identifying the differences between gymnosperms and flowering plants, let us now proceed to the flowering plant's economic significance. Flowering plants are extremely important to humans. In fact, our survival as a species depends on them. Not only are flowering plants vital in our nature and environment, but they also have economic significance. All our major food crops are flowering plants, including the cereal crops rice, wheat, corn, and barley. Here we have the pictures of rice, wheat, and barley along with its flowers. Next, we have woody flowering plants. Woody flowering plants such as oak, cherry, and walnut provide us with valuable number. Next, flowering plants give us fibers such as cotton and linen and medicines such as digitalis and codeine. For the cotton, we can have many uses for it. It can be used as for making fabric and also can be used in medical purposes. For the digitalis, digitalis creates digoxin. It is used to improve the strength and efficiency of the heart or to control the rate and rhythm of the heartbeat. Next, we have the codeine. Codeine is an opiate and pro-drug of morphine, mainly used to treat pain, coughing, and diarrhea. It is also commonly used as a recreational drug. It is found naturally in the sap of the opium poppy. Products as diverse as cork, rubber, tobacco, coffee, chocolate, and aromatic oils for perfumes come from flowering plants. So here we have the different examples. We have the rubber, coffee, and lavender flowers. For the rubber, it can be found in materials that can be used in our everyday lives. Next, we have the coffee. The coffee is a drink that is loved by many. And for the lavender, it is a popular scent that can be also used for relaxation purposes. All of the examples stated in the significance of flowering plants are under the economic botany. Economic botany is a subdiscipline of botany that deals with plants of economic importance, and most of these are flowering plants. Next, we have the ethnobotany. Ethnobotany is a study of the traditional uses of plants by indigenous people. The modern medical establishment has learned to respect reports about medicinal plants in the traditions of indigenous peoples because they provide clues about which plants to test. Studies show that plants identified as useful by shamans or native healers are traditional plant users are up to 60% more likely to have medicinal value than plants that are randomly collected. Ethnobotany the study of traditional uses of plants by indigenous people helps pharmaceutical companies identify medicinal plants. Unfortunately, 
much of this knowledge is disappearing as indigenous peoples are exposed to modern ways and their traditions are forgotten. So related to ethnobotany is a picture below. An ethnobotanist consults with the Tirio Indian in Suriname about the uses of a rainforest plant. Now, we will have a comparison between the two largest classes of following plants, namely the monocots and the eudicots. Let us start with the monocots. The monocots are grass and grass-like flowering plants, and their seeds typically contain one embryonic leaf or cotyledon. A cotyledon is the seed leaf of a plant embryo, which may contain food stored for germination. For the examples of monocots, we have the orchids and the lilies. The, next, we have the eudicots. The eudicots or eudicotyledons are a clade of flowering plants mainly characterized by having two seed leaves upon germination. So with the base word die, which means two, the eudicots have two cotyledons. And its examples are roses and sunflowers. Here is a table uh, in comparison of monocots and eudicots based on the following features. First, we have the flower parts, pollen grains, the leaf venation, the vascular bundles in stem cross section, the roots, the seeds, and the secondary growth, wood and bark. First, for the flower parts. For the monocots, they are usually in threes, groups of three. And for the eudicots, we have usually in fours or fives. Next, for the pollen grains, for the monocots, they have one furrow or pore, and for the eudicots, they have three furrows or pores. For the leaf venation, the monocots are usually parallel, and for the eudicots, they are usually netted. Next, for the vascular bundles in stem cross-section, the monocots are usually scattered or more complex arrangement. The eudicots are arranged in a ring or a circle. For the roots, the monocots have usually fibrous root system. For the eudicots, they have a usually tap root system. For the seeds, embryo with one cotyledon for the monocots an embryo with two cotyledons for the eudicots. And lastly, the secondary growth would embark. For monocots, it is absent, and for eudicots, they are often present. So I will be discussing about the life cycle of the flowering plants, but before that, I will just do a quick recap about each part, because I will also include this later on. So we've learned that the flowering plants have petals, stamen, pistil, stigma, style, and ovary. So the petals, ito na sa taas na part na ating flower, the orange color one, it protects and surrounds the reproductive parts of a flower. Ang stamen naman, it consists of a thin stalk or the filament and an anther where pollen forms. Itong brown color na small, tapos may... Uh, Thin filament na green, this is our stamen, tapos yung brown is our anther. The pistil consists of a stigma, itong nasa gitna, this is our pistil. Yung yellow na nasa taas is our stigma. This is where the pollen lands. Yung style naman, itong neck, this is where the pollen tube will grow, and later on we will discuss it further. Yung ovary, itong nasa baba, this contains one or more of these. Now let's go to the life cycle of the flowering plants. On this part, please refer to the Ibu Pharma's clear yung picture. So we will start here sa pinakababa, which is we have here flower of mature sporophyte. When we say sporophyte, it means it forms spores. Why it means sporophyte? So here we will find our anther. Palog ng ating anther, we have microsporangia. And then within the microsporangia, we have microspore mother cell. So ulitin ko sa anther, we have microsporangia. And then sa loob ni microsporangia, we have microspore mother cell. 
So these cells will eventually undergo meiosis and the part na to, they will become a haploid gametophyte because the meiosis, diba, it forms a haploid which is divided into four daughter cells. So dito sa meiosis, they will be divided into four cells and eventually these cells will become a pollen grain. So a gametophyte na phase is actually a sexual production phase ng ating plants. So ang pollen grain, uh, it has two sperm cells na gagamitin para sa fertilization later on. Balik tayo sa flower of mature sporophyte because here we will also find our ovary. Sa ovary ng plants, we have megasporangium or the ovule. And within the megasporangium or the ovule, we will find the megaspore mother cells. So if the anther has microsporangia, sa ovary naman, we have megasporangium or ovule. And then, if the microsporangia have microspore mother cell, the megasporangium has megaspore mother cell. And kagaya ni microspore mother cell, the megaspore mother cell will also undergo meiosis and then form a haploid, which is divided into four cells. But eventually, on this part, from the four cells, yung tatlo sa kanila will be disintegrate and uh, yung natirang isa it will be it will become our embryo sac so ulitin ko sa sa ovary yung megasperm mother cell when it undergo meiosis it will um divided into four cells and then sa apat na cells yung tatlong cell will eventually be disintegrated and then yung isa Sana nyo may function sa fertilization because it will be our embryo sac. Going back sa ating pollen grain, dito na part, papasok ang ating mga pollinators. When we say pollinators, they bring the pollen grain sa ating stigma. An example of these are animals like bees, uh, butterfly, insects, and etc. So, on this part, Yung pollinators, dadalhin nila yung mga pollen grain or the immature male gametophyte sa stigma. Diba sabi ko kanina yung stigma, this is where our pollen lands. So dito sa style, sabi ko din kanina, the pollen tube will grow and then eventually that pollen tube will be up as a passageway ng male gametophyte papunta pa baba sa ating embryo sac. So, now let's focus muna sa ating embryo sac or what we call the female gametophyte. Now, let's look at this picture. So, we have here sa pinakasilid when we say funiculus, it provides the soul of the seed and the parent plant. We also have here the integuments. When we say integuments, it means the outer layer of the ovule and it develops into a seed coat as the ovule matures following fertilization. So usually, sa gymnosperm, there is only one integument. But since flowering plants are angiosperms, uh, they have two integuments. So we have one and two. Next is we have micropyl. The microfilm permits the passage of the pollen tube into the ovule. So as I said earlier, the male gametophyte has two sperm cells and that sperm cells will enter the pollen tube pagdating sa stigma, pababa sa embryo sac. So before they enter the embryo sac, they will pass through the microfilm. And then pagdating dito, one of the, one of the sperm cells will fuse sa egg nucleus or sa egg and then they will form a zygote that grows by mitosis and develops into a multicellular embryo in the seed. Yung sa isang sperm cell naman, 
it will fuse papunta sa polar polar nuclei at kung nasa gitna and then it will it will fuse with the two haploid polar nuclei to form a triploid three or three n cell that grows by mitosis and develops in, into an endosperm so when we say an endosperm it is a nutrient tissue rich in lipids proteins and carbohydrates that nourishes the growing embryo basically yung dalawang cells from the male gametophyte will enter through microfilm one and the one cell will fuse the egg and eventually they will form zygote in a process called mitosis and then yung isang cell yung natirang cell they will fuse it will fuse sa polar nuclei itong nasa gitna and then it will form a endosperm so ang endosperm is an uh, it stores nutrients in which is rich in lipids proteins and carbohydrates so what i have explained is actually a fertilization process that involves two separate nuclear fusion and that is what we call a double fertilization now the next subtopic that i will be discussing is about how seeds and fruits develop after fertilization but this is actually um discussed by other groups also from previous topic but i will recall this again so this is part of our topic too so people said ko kanina sa double fertilization we have uh the the one sperm the one sperm cell from male gametophyte fuses the egg cell and then that eventually became the the zygote and then the zygote will be divided to form a embryo tapos ng embryo natin we have plumule and the radical so plumule ito nasa taas is um they will become the first shoot yung radical naman itong nasa baba they will become the first shoot the remaining contents of the ovule will develop into cotyledon which will subsequently act as a food storage so since seeds have no leaves they can undergo photosynthesis so cotyledon will serve as a food storage at the earlier stage of growth of the seeds so we also have seed coat Sabi ko kanina sa integument, they will form a seed coat if the ovule matured. So, the seed coat is a protective layer that forms from the ovary wall. And while the ovule develops seeds, ovary is responsible for the development of fruits. Now, how can we say na magiging cycle ito? For example, you have eaten a fruit and then pinapon mo yung seed. And then once the seed lands in a suitable place, it may germinate and develop into a mature sporophyte. And then it produces um, fruits or new plants. And then that is how the life, con the life cycle continues as described. So from sporophyte, again, mag undergo na meiosis, and then so on. However, do you know that sometimes flowering plants produce embryos in seeds without the fusion of gametes? This process is known as apo apomixis. So the apo sa apomixis, hindi sila, uh, they do not undergo ito sa, para sa double fer fertilization na mag-undergo ng meiosis and then sexual production because in apomixis, the sexual formation of a seed from the maternal tissues of the ovule avoids the process of meiosis and fertilization, leading to, all, to um, direct embryo fertilization. That means that the apomixis, it is a sexual um, reproduction or a sexual production of plants. Once a pollen grain lands on a compatible stigma, it starts germinating. This is marked by the growth of a pollen tube down the length of the style. The pollen tube carries the male gametes towards the embryo sac. As the male gamete approaches the embryo sac, its nucleus divides in two. 
and as the pollen tube reaches the ovule, the polar nuclei in the female gametophyte fuse into one diploid nucleus. The pollen tube bursts and releases the two male gametes into the cytoplasm of the synergid. The contents of the pollen tube are released in one of the synergids and as the egg cell and synergids are in close contact, sperms do not have to travel a long distance. The sperms exhibit amoeboid movement. One of the male gametes moves towards the egg and the other to the polar nuclei. Only one of the two sperm fuses with the egg, resulting in syngamy or true fertilization, which leads to the formation of a diploid cycle. The second male gamete fuses with the haploid polar nuclei to form a triploid cell, technically called the primary endosperm nucleus or PEN for short. As three haploid nuclei are involved in the fusion, this process is also termed triple fusion. These more or less simultaneous events, that is syngamy and triple fusion, are collectively termed double fertilization. And they are a hallmark of angiosperm reproduction. Fertilization in flowering plants accomplishes two things. One, it creates a diploid zygote, which develops into an embryo. And two, it creates a triploid cell that is the PEN, which eventually develops into endosperm, a nutrient-rich tissue that supplies energy to a plant embryo during its development. Densely packed cells in the tissue around the ovule form the tough seed coat, an outer layer that protects the developing embryo from water loss and other damage. While the ovule develops into a seed, the walls of the ovary develop into a fruit, another structure that distinguishes angiosperms. To keep learning with such engaging videos, download Baiju's The Learning App today. The success of flowering plants as a result of their ecological domination and the large number of species can be attributed to their evolutionary adaptations. Seed production as the main method of reproduction and dissemination. An adaptation shared with the gymnosperms is fairly significant and provides a definite advantage over seedless vascular plants. Close purpose and double fertilization also improve the likelihood that flowering plants will successfully reproduce. Close carpels are responsible to produce fruits that are surrounded by seeds. Double fertilization is the process resulting in the growth of embryo nourishing endosperm. Another factor contributing to the success of angiosperms is the emergence diverse interconnections with various insect, bird, and bat species that transfer pollen from one flower of a species to another. Cross-fertilization, caused by pollen transfer, mixes the genetic information and encourages genetic variety in the offspring. Remember that in addition to tracheids, the majority of flowering plants also feature effective water-conducting cells called vessel elements in their silent. On the other hand, tracheids make up the entire silent in nearly all gymnosperms, including seedless vascular plants. The majority of flowering plants also include effective sugar-conducting cells in their phloem, known as sieve tube elements. Other than flowering plants and metophytes, vascular plants lack sieve tube and vessel elements. Leaves, it is effective at absorbing light for photosynthesis due to the broad and expanded blades of flowering plants' leaves. Abscission or shedding reduces water loss and has enabled some flowering plants to expand into habitats that would otherwise be too harsh for survival. Some flowering plants have been able to spread into habitats that would be too harsh for survival because of the abscission or shedding of these leaves during cold or dry seasons, which lowers water loss. Stems and roots, often modified for food or water storage, another characteristic that helps flowering plants survive in difficult situations is the modification of their stems and roots for food or water storage. Flowering plants easily adapt to different conditions and habitats. The enormous diversity displayed by the numerous flowering plant species demonstrates this flexibility. The cactus, for instance, is remarkably well suited for environments in such a desert. Its thick, 
waxy cuticle prevents water loss and its leaves reduce surface area for transpiration or loss of water vapor and potential protection from thirsty herbivorous animals. Its stem retains water. The water lily, on the other hand, is well adapted for moist conditions, in particular because it contains air channels that give stems and roots to survive in oxygen-poor water. The evolution of flowering plants is the most recent group of plants to evolve. In evolution, new structures often originate by modification of previously existing structures or organs. Supports the classic interpretation of the four organs of a flower, the sepals, petals, stamens, and carpels. Also includes the comparison of the arrangement of vascular tissues in both flowers and leafy stems and of the developmental stages of floral parts and leaves. The flower consists of four organs and they are the following, sepals, petals, stamens, and carpel. Sepals is the exterior part of a flower. It is a small part growing at the base of the petal that look like tiny leaves. And they are the ones that protect the interior of a flower and is the most leaf-like out of all the floral organs. And botanists generally agree that sepals are specialized leaves. For petals, they are the ones responsible for attracting pollinators to the flower as they give the flower their unique shape as they are often brightly colored. For stamens, is the male reproductive organ of a flower. It is the one responsible for producing pollen and makes it available for pollinators to allow reproduction. It has two main parts, the anther and the filament. Carpel, also known as the pistil, is the female organ, organ of a flower, wherein each carpel is usually a bowling pin shape and features a sac of its base at the center of a flower and this sac is the ovary that produces and contains developing seeds or ovules. Plants possess flowers. Flowers are the reproductive structure of the plant. In a flower, the male sex organ is called the stamen and the female sex organ is called the pistil. Before that, let's have a look at the typical structure of a flower. It appears somewhat like this. A flower has mainly two components. Now what do we mean by this? Every flower is mainly composed of two parts. They are the essential and the non-essential parts. Do we know what these are? The parts of a flower such as the stamen and the pistil, which are the reproductive parts, are the essential parts. Their function says it all. These are essential because they are directly involved in the process of reproduction. Do we mean that if these structures are not present, then a plant will not be able to reproduce? Yes, that's absolutely correct. So how will the plant be able to reproduce if the gamete producing structures are not present? And what are the other parts then? Floral parts such as the petals and sepals are the next in our list and they are the non-essential parts of a flower. These floral parts do not take part in the process of reproduction directly and are therefore called the non-essential parts. Now let's discuss each part in detail. To begin with, we have the stamen, which is the male part. What does the stamen look like? If we zoom in the structure, it looks like this. Stamen has two distinct parts, the anther and the filament. Do you think that these structures have specific functions to perform? Yes, as a matter of fact, they do. The part called the anther bears minute round bodies called pollen grains which play an active role in reproduction. There is a specific process by which pollen grains are transferred from the anther to the female part of the same or different flower. Now, what is that part called? For that, we need to focus on to our next floral part, the pistil, which is the female part. The pistil has three distinct subparts. And what are these subparts? They are the stigma, style, and the ovary. Do these structures have specific functions? Yes, they do. The part called stigma is the landing place for the pollen. And what exactly do we mean by this? Pollen from the male part, the anther, land on the stigma and germinate further. 
This process is what we call pollination in plants. Next comes the style, which is a slender stalk that holds up the stigma in position and connects it with the ovary. What about the ovary then? It is the swollen basal part of the pistil which contains the ovules. But what are ovules and what is their function? Ovules are the female gametes that get fertilized and form the embryo. Although incomplete, fossil records suggest that flowering plants descended from genosperms, where beetles were evidently visiting these plants and possibly transferring pollen from one plant to another. Biologists have suggested that perhaps this relationship was the beginning of co-evolution and mutual adaptation between plants and their animal pollinators. The netophytes are the genosperm group some botanists consider the closest living relatives of flowering plants. Both structural similarities and certain comparative molecular data supports this conclusion, as most of them use structural data where they hypothesize that flowering plants arose only once, for there is only one evolutionary from the genosperm to the flowering plants. The oldest definitive trace of flowering plants in a fossil record was the Acrofructicus plant. It consists of ovules enclosed in tiny pod-like fruits interpreted as carpels in the Jurassic and Lower Cretaceous rocks some 125 million to 145 million years ago. There are six angiosperms, three from the basal angiosperms and three from the coral angiosperms. The basal angiosperms is thought to be ancestral to all other flowering plants. It consists of three subgroups, the umbrella, the water lilies, and the star anise. The umbrella is the oldest surviving group of basal angiosperms, which is represented by a single living species. Example of this is the Amborella trachopoda, a shrub native to New Caledonia. Water lilies is the second oldest surviving lineage that contains about 70 species of aquatic or wetland herbs. Star anise is the third group of basal angiosperms, which consists of 100 species of vines, trees, shrubs found mostly in warmer climates. For core angiosperms, this has the most angiosperm species that belong to and is divided into three subgroups, the magnoliids, the monocots, and the unicots. The magnoliids are classified as dicots, but molecular evidence indicates that they are either unicots or monocots, as they are mainly consist of herbs. The difference between the monocots and the unicots is that the monocots contains only one cotyledon in its embryo, while unicots, on the other hand, has two. Additional information about the monocots and the unicots is that they have the greatest number of species, as monocots have 11 orders, around 70,000 species, while unicot has around 210,000 species of plant in 44 orders. For the 12 flowering plant families, they provide other organisms with a continuous supply of energy that they have in order to survive, as all animals require flowering plants directly or indirectly. Even early humans use flowering plants as well in order to survive in the wild for its source of shelter, food, clothing, and as well as cooking. Even today, we still use it in a variety of ways. 12 of more than 300 families are highlighted here to show their importance to humans and to the vice biosphere. One is the magnolia family, two is the walnut family, three is the cactus family, four is the mustard family, five is the rose family, six is the pea family, seven is the potato family, eight is the pumpkin family, nine is the sunflower family, then 10 is the grass family, 11 is the orchid family, and last but not the least is the Adelaide family. In the magnolia family, it has around 230 species of trees and shrubs native to temperate and tropical areas of Asia and America and are classified as magnolies. They are easy to recognize because they have simple alternate leaves and large conspicuous flowers that contains 
numerous tannins and crystals. Their fruits are cone-like and many scientists regard them as one of the more primitive families of flowering plants alive today based on its flower structure. And also includes ornamentals and timber trees. An example of this is the tulip tree and the southern magnolia. In the walnut family, they are also known as the Juglandisai, which has about 50 to 60 species of walnuts, hickories, and pecans. Deciduous trees native to the temperate and subtropical areas of Asia and North and South America. The leaves are finically compound and arranged alternately on the stem. Members of the walnut family are monoecious and bear separate male and female flowers of the same plant. Ecologically and economically important for its edible nuts and wood. In the cactus family, they consist of more than 2,000 species of perennial herbs, vines, shrubs, and small trees. Usually found in the desert and are succulent plants that store water in their stems or leaves to survive in periods of drought. Not only are they able to survive in the desert, but they eventually adapt in the tropical rainforest where it grows as an empty fight. Cacti is economically important primarily as ornamentals for some are cultivated for their fleshy, edible fruits and as a wide appeal as houseplants because of their attractive flowers and the variety of spine and rib formations which can be a great houseplant as they don't need to be watered on a regular basis. In the mustard family, the Prusicaceae, or alternatively known as the Cruciferi, consists of about 3,000 species, many of which are important for food crops, ornamentals, and weeds. They are mostly found worldwide, and most species are annual or perennial herbs. The leaves are simple and arranged alternately on the stem, where the flowers are usually arranged in an inflorescence. And the rose family, are also known as the Rosaceae, is a large and important family of about 3,370 species, many of which are cultivated as ornamentals because of their beauty and fragrance. An example of this is the rose, where some fruiting plants, including apples, pears, and peaches, are eaten raw, baked, roasted, sauteed, and even cleaned. The pea family, also known as the Fidesi or the Legumonosi, includes 17,000 species throughout the world and contains food and forage crops second only to the grass family in importance. Mostly herbs, vines, shrubs, or trees belong to the pea family as their leaves are finitely compound with an alternate leaf arrangement where most of their roots contains noodles which enables members of the pea family to thrive in relatively poor soil conditions. The potato family, also known as Solanaceae, consists of 2,000 to 3,000 species which are found worldwide. It consists primarily of herbs, although a few members are shrubs or small trees. The flowers are usually regular and typically contain five sepals, five petals, five stamens, and a compound pistil composed of two fused carpels. Many members of the potato family contain toxic alkaloids that have medicinal value at low concentrations. An example of this is the belladonna, also known as the deadly nightshade, which is the source of the alkaloid atropine, the substance used to treat poisoning from nerve gas and certain pesticides. Also an example of this is the Jimson weed, which contains the hallucinogenic alkaloid scopolamine. This was ingested by Native Americans to produce visions during important rituals, such as puberty rites, but its overall toxicity prevented its widespread use. Chewing the seeds can be fatal. The pumpkin family also known as Cucurbita C, contains more than 700 species of pumpkins, melons, squashes, cucumbers, and gourds. The pumpkin genus Cucurbita includes plants 
such as pumpkins, squashes, gourds, vegetable marrow. Most species in the pumpkin family are animals or perennials, native primarily to tropical and subtropical areas. Many members of the family are herbaceous or woody vines with tendrils and simple leaves with palmate venation. The female flowers have inferior ovaries with three usually fused carpels. The sunflower family, also known as Cumpacity or alternatively as Teraceae, is a large complex family that consists of about 25,000 species found around the world. Most are animals or perennial herbs, shrubs, although some are biennials. It includes chrysanthemums, marigolds, dahlias, sunflowers, and daisies. And there are some which are food plants, such as lettuce, endive, sunflower, Jerusalem artichokes, and globe artichokes. Some members of the sunflower family produce chemicals used as insecticides, dyes, or medicines. Plants belonging to the sunflower family of a dense head-like inflorescence called a capitulum, which consists of an aggregation of few hundreds of flowers crowded together on a receptacle. The capitulum usually contains two types of flowers or florets, the large outer ray florets, which appear to be petals, and the small inner disc florets. The grass family, also known as poaceae, or alternatively, Graminiae contains about 9,000 species and is the most important family of flowering plants because it includes the cereal grains such as rice, wheat, oats, and corn. It supplies humans with many important foods and provides forage and fodder for domesticated animals. Grasses provide shelter, notably bamboo, for buildings and thatch grass leaves for roofing. Each grass leaf has parallel venation and consists of a long narrow blade and a sheath that wraps around the stem above the nodes. The stem may be erect or creeping and is usually hollow except at the nodes where it is always solid. Grasses have fibrous root systems. Flowers of grasses occur in inflorescences and are highly modified. Petals are quite reduced or absent, and each flower typically contains three stamens and a pistil, with two feathery stigmas and an ovary containing one ovule. The orchid family, also known as Orchidaceae, occurs worldwide and contains at least 18,000 species and is one of the largest families of flowering plants. They are monocots and are perennial herbs. One fourth to one third of all orchid species are in danger of extinction as a result of the destruction of their natural habitats and over collection by orchid hobbyists. The roots of terrestrial orchids are like those of other plants whereas aerial roots of epiphytic orchids are thick and covered with velamen. The aerial roots of many orchids are unusual in that they are green and photosynthesized. Other orchids have pseudobulbs, false bulbs, which are thickened stems at or above the soil level that arise from a horizontal rhizome and serve as a storage organ for food and water. Each pseudobulb bears one or more leaves and eventually a flower stalk. After it flowers, the pseudobulb slowly dies. Orchid leaves are usually fleshy. Each flower consists of three petal-like sepals and three petals. The third petal forming a lip that differs in color and shape from the rest of the sepals and petals. The reproductive structures are born in the center of the flower called the column. Pollen is aggregated into masses called pollinia. Orchids are widely cultivated by forests and orchid 
fanciers for their fascinating flowers, and breeders have developed many thousands of hybrids by crossing different species. The agave family, also known as agaveciae, contains about 600 species and is found throughout tropical and semi-tropical areas, particularly in arid regions. Agaves are monocots that are perennial herbs or woody shrubs and trees. The leaves of plants in the agave family are crowded into a rosette at the base of the stem and are stiff, fleshy, narrow, and sharp-pointed. Agaves bear their flowers in inflorescences. Each flower consists of three petal-like sepals and three petals, joined to form a tube, six stamens, and a compound pistil composed of three fused carpels. Many agaves are cultivated as ornamentals, both outdoors in semi-arid regions and indoors as house plants. Okay, thank you, reporters. Please on your thumb. Tanyola, Bucador, Carlon, Kualia, and Namaste. Tanyola and Paloma. Okay. Can I ask group A? No? To ask their question. So, what evolutionary change has taken place in the ancient Angus sperms to evolve into flowering plants? Um, to answer your question, in evolution, it often originates from modification to existing structures or organs as they undergo sexual reproduction as the seeds are enclosed within an ovary that later, which later becomes a fruit and that fruit protects the developing seeds and aids in the dispersal of the developing seeds and another factor for the successful adaptation for the flowering plants is that they have this mutual adaptation or mutual agreement from their animal pollinators as they have this interdependent relationship where they trans where they transfer pollen from one plant to another and another factor for that is that they have this success in terms of ecological Ballad, a dominance in the number of species as they surpass the number of genus sperms as they have approximately um, 300,000 number of species that uh, that has adopted to new habitats and they have different forms of forms of shapes and sizes which um, which dominates the earth's um, Bioecosystem, human form. Okay, thank you, Aline. Next, group nine. Um, how are flowering flowering plants important to humans? Flowering plants are important to humans as they provide us many resources like um like food water and shelter for animals especially medicine they contain many of them many of them contain um medicinal properties which are used for different diseases mm -hmm. thank you and last group 11 So, what is the main difference between androsperms and gymnosperms? Okay. So, we are uh, there are many notable differences between gymnosperms and androsperms. An example na lang dito is their reproductive structure. So, as discussed earlier, the reproductive structure for gymnosperms are usually cones and sa androsperms are flowers. And also another difference is the seeds nila. Um, the gymnosperms have exposed seeds while the angiosperms have enclosed seeds. But their main difference is the angiosperms are able to, uh, to bear fruit. So upon fertilization, the ovules, uh, 
which contain the egg cell develop into seeds and the ovary um, will later ripen and mature to form a fruit you know okay thank you Belle. okay um why does angiosperms undergo double fertilization um angiosperms po ma'am undergo double fertilization since um sa um di ba po pag if after po pollination ang mag um produce po niyan is the vegetative and and the generative cell po ma'am tapos um fertilization of course after pollination po so if the um sperm po ma'am cells enter the embryo sac po um both is mag participate po for fertilization ang um, one sir one sperm cell po ma'am is mag fuse with the egg to produ produce um zygote po ma'am and the other one is mag produce po ng endosperm po thank you thank you and how will you differentiate basal and core angiosperms at my basal and bat my core what are those Basal and core. Basal and core. Actually, sperm, no? Um, basal, mostly, they are branch out from common ancestors po, since they are monophyletic. Um, core and sperm, summary, po, is that they branched off from the, uh, dito, from the angiosperm family tree. Po. So that's the difference between the two of them. Po. Okay, thank you, Elaine. And last. How does flowering plants classified into their families? Paano sila na classify into their families? Or how do they distinguish into their families? Kung saan sila na belong? Yes, go ahead. Hello, Based on their uh, characteristics, po, their similarities, like their, like their flowers, reproductive structures, and other evolutionary characteristics. Po. Okay. And as well as their type of fruits, diba? and also their, their leaves, and as well as their uh, uses also. Okay, thank you, group six. So again, um, wala well, kayong post test ngayon for this topic, but you will have your second quiz this Saturday. The coverage is bryophytes lang. The quiz will be open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. only. So again, your second quiz will be on Saturday, open until 8 p.m. only, and the coverage is bryophytes. And then on Monday, your third quiz, the coverage will be seedless vascular, angiosperms, and gymnosperms. Uh, morning, we have one in the day, 9.45 to 10.45. And then after the, your quiz, we will meet one hour long for our last reporter, which is the ecosystem. Clear for class. Questions? Yes, Anna. I'm about to start and dance.